where I was born, and so that's half of my ancestry. Is is um, my father is Balinese, um, and but what I wanted to talk about today was the 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 witch, and and so often today we 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 I think we collectively in the West have certain ideas about the witch. Some obvious ones that I think have been successfully countered are that which is uh, inherently diabolical or satanic, um, which is more of a yesteryear kind of notion. Um, however, some of the some of the current ideas of, of the witch are also quite whitewashed, I, I believe, quite um, diluted. Um, and so, what I wanted to talk about is actually the the vast legacy of witchcraft in the in the human psyche because I consider witchcraft to be a human phenomenon um, as it relates to the non-human world. Um, and also about how the fairy people um, are intrinsically related to the notion of being a witch and also of what it means to have witchcraft happen to you. Because I think a lot of the modern um, there, like there is a, there are many, there are many expressions and, and, and descriptions and pathways to kind of realizing one's witch nature or, or working with magic in a witchy way. For me, um, it it has been something that has happened to me. I have experienced it happening to me. And if you look at the older, the older records we have of people either being accused of witchcraft in, in Western and Southern Europe or um, confessing completely to it. The context of it is more that, um, that the spirits have come to these people and awoken them. So it's, it's less of um, what, it is, what it is sometimes now, which is still cool, and I, and I, and I like that as well, which is, which is considered to be almost like a, a form of emotional, spiritual empowerment um, in connection with, with, with nature as a general concept. Um, what it was, was, was more of something that we now identify as um, shamanistic. Um, so it was, it was people who may have had no prior connection to, um, or, to or a conscious desire to be a witch. You know, it wasn't something they wanted to do because it would have you killed. Um, but it was something that happened to people in the, in the night, you know, in the primordial darkness. Uh, when the spirits will have always been considered to be more active, when our minds are more lubricated to that 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 gnosis, that interrelation between the the average human going ons and the and the rest of what's actually happening in the non-human world, which is most of this world is the non-human world actually, and then how do we how do we reconcile the great dearth of um, uh, of, of difference and and um, the void that exists continuously ongoingly between what is human and what is not human or more than human or other than human and so the witch has always been positioned by context and circumstance and also sometimes choice um, to exist between the human and the non-human and to be that that bridge dweller or that edge walker in order to um, create kinship that both provokes catalyzes and serves the human um, so we have this idea of the witch as being the, the archetypal, prototypical person who is um, stirred, initiated, awakened by the spirits, the potent forces of wild nature, the rest of nature of which we are a part, and who go beyond the, comf the comfort and the safety of, of, of being a human in a human village or a human world with human assumptions and human um, self-interest. Um, going way beyond that into into another world that is unhinged, primal, raw, chaotic, not human at all, um, and and risking everything. Witchcraft always requires a risk. It requires a rebellion against um, self-serving human interests. Um, so so that therefore we can both survive as a, as a human species and preserve ourselves, but also in that. Um, be, be, be obliged to um, nourishing the forces that nourish us um, and being in constant conscious relationship 
And obviously, pragmatically, not everyone can take on the mantle of speaking to the non-human. There, there have to be humans who are actually fulfilling the roles of the blacksmith or the, or the baker or, or whatever. And, and then there are often those other folk who, who need to take on the mantle and were drawn by some, by some what I feel is like a human ecology which if you want to look more into the ecology of magic as it relates to human evolution, there's an amazing book called The Spell of the Sensuous by David Abram that really talks quite, quite academically actually about how magic serves a human um, psychology and ecology. Um, so, the, so witches, the story of witchcraft has in, in Europe, because it is a European legacy and a European word, though it, it's everywhere, um, it serves a particular kind of interest in the, in the human dream in the human mind in the human in the human condition it, it, it we are we cannot um, it, it does not serve humans to be uh, attached only to what um, in only what uh, serves us it serves us to actually also have an interest in what uh, makes us uncomfortable what provokes us and what uh, therefore catalyzes um, and turns over the soil of, of human fertility and when I say human fertility, I mean just the broadest evolutionary benefit of us as a species in relationship, again, with all of the other species and beings upon this planet. And the fairy people come into this is, is because the older understanding of the fairy people was not as the Victorian era has now brought it forward, which is little winged beings that live at the bottom of your garden, although the bottom of your garden reference is contextual because it's the edge. Fairies dwell in places that cannot be um, cannot be held. It's like like I like fairy. When you cup water, and it disappears, that's the, that's that's what a fairy feels like for me. That's the substance of fairy. That's the idea of fairy. It's something that is ephemeral um, and that lives just beyond the corner of something. But uh, the witch the witch also does that. And so f f for many many years in, in in the Western cultures, in the European cultures that have come to us. Um, the understanding of fairy has, has not always been um, a daver of nature or a spirit of nature, and not necessarily has it always been uh, non-corporeal or discarnate. In fact, fairies were often considered to be very corporeal, um, just of a different kind of resonance. Um, you know, different words. The, old, the oldest, un our older understandings of the fairy people were that they were just another race that there were another kind of a race of people that had their own laws and customs and creeds, and they, and they worked by that, and the farmers and the tillers of the fields and those who lived in the areas closest to rural wild nature, not in cities, had to deal with them on a daily basis. There was fear and concern, and, and how do we offer to the fairies so that they don't hijack us, steal our children, make us sick, curdle the, the, the milk and the cows, and this also was attached to witches because witches were the ones in the human story, and story is the most powerful thing that humans have, um, I think, um, is that witches were the ones who were fulfilling the roles of the fairy people in the human consciousness as well. So it was this idea that the witches were being ridden by these non-human fairy, uh, fairy powers and kind of disseminating that um, into the human world in order to balance the, the, the human and the wild um, in order to make sure that the kinship stays strong and if you look again at older like if you look at what we have left of pre-Abrahamic pre-Christian Nordic and Scandinavian cultures there's a lot of references to elves um, to this day also in Iceland you will still find uh, people and, and, and journalists and news reports and even in their government who are concerned legitimately about the impact of, um, of elves and um, to, the, to the Icelandic people, an elf is a fairy, there's no real difference. Um, and that these are a different kind of people that have a legitimate presence and you have to be concerned. You can't build your road there because that's where the elves are. And so the witches, again, are the people who are hired often or, or sought out by, by people who, who, who that's not their job because it's a kind of profession. And um, people seek these people out to this day and ask them, you know, they are, they are specialists of the spirit world, which is a specialist of the spirit world, and technicians of magic. And so you go up, you go ask the witches, like, what should we do here? You know, should we should we move this road? How do we divine the ley lines in this land? Um, and so there is the there is the kind of witch that is the helping witch that is going to um, 
always be probably held at arm's length by the human community because of they represent the volatile forces of nature that if you bring them into the center of the community will destabilize the community and it will fall apart. Um, but if you, but if it's at the edge where it's where it's you know dynamic and that's its place, that's all good. And to this day, the spirit specialists all over the world in Bali, in Bali where I live as well, where they're held completely on a pedestal, are still at the end of the village, are still not in the center where they're where because they are ridden by the volatile forces of nature. Gods are included in that; they're, they're considered volatile forces of nature. You cannot have them in the center of things. Otherwise, it will destabilize the entire human society. So there are, it's like humans, humans in primal animistic indigenous cultures, which is not so much the West anymore, they still have places, you know, for, for all of these specialists of the spirit world. Um, and of course, when you're not in your profession as a spirit worker, you can go about your day, you know, and you still carry that within you, and you but you can go to your family and go to a birthday party and all of that, and you're not going to destabilize people. But when you're in the full flowing current of your, of your power, of your legacy as a, as, a, as a spirit worker, as a witch, then people are going to have a different kind of attitude to you and a different kind of relationship to you. And of course, in a culture where none of that is applicable, where all of that is actually the sign of being evil, then you're going to exterminate these people. Um, because more and more over time, um, people in European cultures became more and more convinced cosmologically in the mindset that these people were actually there to not just destabilize, provoke, or question community mores and values and, and laws, but to actually completely um, tear, tear it away, eat it, devour it, etc. Um, and this, this actually, I think, was a product of the times because it, in, during the witch hysteria in Europe, um, that was a period of Europe that was basically everything was going to hell. You know, the Black Plague, it was all people dying everywhere. And so there had always been witches, there had always been people like that, but now there was a convenient scapegoat. And, and because already people held those people at arm's length, because of pra what people considered practical and also theological reasons, now it was like, oh, these people, they're haunting, they started haunting the psyche of humans at a time when the collective psyche of Europe was deteriorating. And so you had to exterminate them. It was a form of magic within itself psychological magic collectively, we have to exterminate these people who are going to devour us, who are going to destroy us. I feel in some ways too, it was presaging the industrial revolution because, because people were about to become radically severed from nature when they had never been before. And, the, and I believe that the spirit of this planet um, just <laughs> rose up and went okay. And then the witches who have always been bonded to the spirit of the planet um, began to rally their anarchistic warrior cries, and, and, and that, that happened, I think, is, is one of the things, the threads and the tapestry of the story of what happened. And, and for me, as, as a witch, as someone who identifies and experiences myself as a witch, what I mean by that is that when I was young, um, younger, I, had, I, I was woken up by spirits. I had a very, a very dramatic um, experience about 14 years ago in which I had a, had a terrible premonition of a terrible world event. Um, and, I w and I was someone who had no understanding of world politics or any of this, and, and it racked my body for days. I was throwing up everywhere, physically incapacitated, and when you read um, cross-referenced anthropological studies of shamans who are waking up um, to their charge, they're always ill. There's something that happens where they're torn apart by um, volatile forces, and their psyche is obliterated, and this is what I experienced as happening to me. And because it happened in Bali at the time, there was context for it. My father understood it. He took me to diviners and temple priests, and it was understood. And because my family is a little like that, they got it. So I was lucky and blessed to have that context to situate me very well in what is now my only profession, which is writing and teaching and doing acts of magic. Um, to help people, and also not just to help individual people, but ideally to help the kind of global consciousness, um, because we're at a time again of radical uh, distancing from wild nature, and we need to reorient and re-inhabit 
and let nature occupy us. We need to like open the doors and just go, okay, what is the wisdom that we are not listening to? Because as a species, we're rather arrogant. We're, we're, we co we're collectively arrogant. We think we know what is best for the, for the progression well, of our species. And rarely, probably collectively, do we think of how, we, how are we relating and how are we serving the non-human, who are just as important, just as uh, valid, maybe more valid now because we've been ignoring them for so long. Hence, I think also the revival of witchcraft, not just because of uh, magic making us feel good, but magic also being a way to uh, initiate, catalyze, provoke, and challenge. And when you look at the social movements that are intrinsically related to the witchcraft revival, feminism, and queer liberation, and civil rights, and um, land, and uh, bonding with our First Nations and Aboriginal peoples, and and, and all of this stuff is intrinsically related to the, to the witchcraft revival and modern magic. And again, this has created waves of social change that perhaps people never thought they would see. And the ecological movement, all of this stuff is, is intrinsically related to the revival of the craft uh, in the modern world. So it, it, it actually has this larger application um, that we can also call the eternal Sabbath. And, and so the Sabbat, you know, in, in a lot of revivalist to modern witchcraft is considered to be one of the eight, what I call the festivals, one of the eight holy days that are the hinges of the year. The, the solstices, the equinoxes, and the cross quarters. Um, and these are, these are astronomical events because solstices and equinoxes happen and the midpoints are literally considered to be the very midpoint uh, between the equinox and the solstice. So these things are happening. Uh, regardless of whether we, we choose to orient or notice them or not. Um, and they do have precedent. Um, each individual festival and piece of law that we have does have some origin in, in our distant pagan past. It's different now, of course, and we're in different places. We have to re-kind re of re-establish consciously what that means and also listen, listen to the land, ideally. But the, the, the ninth Sabbath, or, or the now, today, we call it the Ninth Sabbath, a lot of us, because we're trying to hint at if there are, think if there are eight hinges of the year, the eternal Sabbath, the one that is always happening, is the ninth one. Um, and so that is considered to be the center um, of, that, of that wheel of the year. And the Sabbath, you know, that word came into the early modern witchcraft hysteria that happened uh, because witches were identified with the, with the Jewish people. <coughs> Um, and because most of Christian Europe detested the Jewish people, um, and they said, and they, and you know, the Christian propaganda was that Jews would eat your children and poison your wells and were doing strange magic. And so um, this was all like completely conflated with witches as well. We, they will eat your children, poison your wells, and do strange magic and worship the devil. And so the, 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 the language used for um, the Jewish rituals, uh, including synagogue, in fact, you can find a lot of references to witches' covens being called witches' synagogues. Um, so there's a strange, strange thing going on with the extermination of a lot of Jewish people as well in the early modern period and witches, or people accused of being witches. Hence, perhaps, a perceived bond between the Kabbalah and witchcraft. Um, and mystic Judaism and witchcraft, um, and potentially, possibly true. You know, if, if Jews and people accused of being witches were being persecuted at the same time, it's not a far stretch to consider that the magic of Judaism was infiltrating the pagan magic of Europe as well, and it had long.